And we are live. Welcome to InSync Live episode 3. My name is Ridwan. Today we are honoured to have Robin with us. He's a sound engineer who has worked in local and regional music scene and on numerous productions over the years, both big and small. Thanks for doing this, Robin. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from a sound engineer because I play shows and I'm always very fond of the sound engineers I've been blessed to work with. So before we even get into what sound engineering is, can you share with us a little bit about your story? Yeah, sure. Um, I had quite an interesting route uh, getting to doing audio and music production. Um, I started out as what most guys in secondary one and sec two would do, which is I just wanted to play music, <clears throat> picked up the guitar, uh, I started jamming, gigging with friends, and eventually, you know, after a few years, I was like, okay, where am I going with this? Okay, so that question lingered in my mind. I went JC, and by the end of JC, I did my A-levels. I did terribly. <laughs> <laughs> I did terribly. And then I went NS. And during that two years, I had sort of a crisis of what did I want to study after this. Because uh, I came from a very traditional uh, like um, mindset of like, I must go JC, then I must go university, and then get a job. Right? Um... And I didn't really know anything about music production or audio engineering or anything of that sort. I just knew <clears throat> that I like music. Um, and for some reason, I was always very interested in how the music is coming out of the speakers. Mm. Yeah, mm. From day one, when I picked up the guitar, when I plugged the guitar into the amp, um, you know, I, I was actually more interested in tweaking the sound on the amp than actually playing the guitar. Oh, interesting. So uh, during NS, like uh, I actually thought about that. And then I, I chanced upon like videos. At the time, it was like the nascent era of YouTube. I chanced upon videos and articles of music production, audio engineering. Um, and then I realized that there's this thing called music production. Now, I, I shit you not, like I really had no idea. Like, I didn't know how songs were recorded. I didn't know anything about what went through the sound that comes out of the speakers or what I hear on the radio. Yeah. Um, so I read articles, I looked at causes in schools, and I realized that, okay, there's this thing. Um, and I've always really liked to tweak the sound on speakers. Like, I was an audiophile. I was always very interested in like what getting the best sound on my headphones, right. getting the best sound on my shitty computer speakers, yeah, or my Logitech speakers. Yeah. So I toyed with the idea of going overseas to study, you know, I realized that's Berkeley, I realized We had a technical issue during the stream. Please continue to enjoy the rest of it. Hey guys, we're back again. <laughs> Sincerely apologize for all the glitches so far. I hope it's all good with you because it's all good with us also. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, technical <laughs> problems are right. always going to happen. Right? And then we just you gotta, deal with it. Yeah, we just got to yeah. deal with it, right? Yeah. So, uh, I entered DMAT mm. <clears throat> and then I discovered this whole world of uh, music production from the songwriting stage all the way until the delivery, which is when it comes out of the speakers, right? Um, yeah, and after I completed DMAT, um, I went to work in this music production studio called Kensi Music. Um, so Kensi is a Ooh. very renowned producer in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, he's worked with many, many <clears throat> top artists. Yeah, so it was really a privilege for me to actually be able to work there for a couple of years. And I, I, I really like uh, found my footing in the industry based off my experiences in Can See Music. Yeah, it's, uh, this, is, this wasn't meant to be a plug for Can See Music, but uh, please, you can go and check it out. <laughs> can See Music because um, they make some really wonderful music. Um, I think 
anybody who wants their music produced. Um, and maybe you can drop them an email. <laughs> yeah, man. We're gonna, we're gonna tag them in this video. Also. <laughs> yeah, sure. And I think my friend is working there now as the engineer. I forgot his name though. So I worked with him a long time ago. It's a Greek sounding name. Can I ask Probably. when you were working there? Yeah. Like, what kind of stuff are we doing? <clears throat> so people were coming in to produce music. Yeah. So, um, how a music production studio usually works is like um you get jobs to arrange music, you get jobs to write music, you get jobs to engineer the music, uh, record the music. <clears throat> basically, if someone... There are a lot of different kinds of jobs that can come in, but basically, it's what the name says, the title says, which is music production, mm. as long as the music is produced. right? Uh, a majority of what I did in Can See Music was uh, a lot of editing, uh, a lot of learning the groundwork of production, which is, to summarize, oftentimes it's really just editing. <laughs> yeah, it's really just editing and learning how to do corrective work for mm. audio, uh, fixing issues. Uh, and then, of course, like, I mean, of course, at a time, my role would also include, like, maintenance of equipment, maintenance of the studio, uh, being the coffee boy for clients mm -hmm, when mm. they come into the studio or whatever, you know. I see. <clears throat> Here and there, I would do like little arrangements or parts of an arrangement for a whole song, mm. right? Um, maybe I'll do stuff like vocal production, which is when uh, a singer comes in, whether it's uh, singing the lead vocals, the, the lead singer or the backing vocals, whatever, you know. I'll record the person, I'll vocal produce, after that I'll edit and you know, I'll do all the production magic. Wow. Right, and that sort of will be the summary of what I was doing there for those couple of years. Um, I mean, of course, there, there's too much to go into, and I don't think it's necessary. It's just, but the takeaway is that I actually learned a lot of the tedious work of production and audio while I was there. So it really gave me a very good footing as to what can I, what am I good at? What am I not good at? What do I actually really like mm -hmm. in this industry and in this segment, right? So while I was at Can See Music, I, also, I was also doing a lot of uh, live sound, right? Um, whatever freelance gigs I would get here and there, you know, I'll work as a crew, I'll be a when I say crew, I really mean crew, Koi Cable, you know, like we're set up, tear down. So, I mean, for, for people who are not familiar with this, it, basically just the guys that are there at like 6 a.m. and then they, they, they are there first and they leave last. La. The audio guys who set up everything, make sure everything is okay for a show. The unsung heroes, man. Yeah, yeah. unsung heroes. But you we, can acknowledge them. I agree. Always. Unsung heroes. Always, uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a tiring and laborious job mm. that is often not uh, recognize la. Yeah, but it's very important um, so I was doing handling both of these uh, segments of the industry which is live sound and studio work um, and I really like both and I refuse to give up either one of them la, because um, live sound had a certain energy and excitement that I liked and mm. studio work had a certain focus and um, the ability to manipulate and influence the the music yeah which i really loved also so it gave me different things and yeah and then from there i just um over the years i built my network i expanded into more areas of audio and music production uh expanded into more areas of live sound because mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of sub sectors mm -hmm. and different uh sectors on the industry and eventually I, I reach a stable point whereby I, I'm no longer too worried about um, jobs. Yeah, because I, I would say that for like the first three to four years, it was a hustle. Yeah, it was about being able to price yourself because mm -hmm. if you're doing freelance, then you have to be able to price yourself in a way that you people hire you and you... 
get jobs and you get enough jobs to survive, mm, but mm, mm. you are also not pricing too low such that like you, you are, you're cheating yourself. Uh. Oh, like spoiling the market also. Yeah. Right. So it, it was a hustle for the first three to four years and eventually I hit a stable point line and then I just built from there more network, meeting more people, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that essentially is my story like, and then, like I'm, I, I'm here now with, so still doing the same thing but uh, at, with I think just a much more varied uh, knowledge on the industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could you, perhaps for some of the viewers <coughs> out there, break down what sound engineering is to you? I think sound engineering to me is really being able to produce, not produce, but being able to make the audio or the music because audio can be just dialogue, can be speech, right? To me, it's about making the audio or the music uh, larger than life. Yep. Um, <clears throat> when you are listening to someone in an acoustic environment, which is like between me and you right now, we are mm-hmm. right in front of each other, like what you're hearing is real. But when you hear something over speakers, uh, they you, you need to do a lot of things in order to make it sound real and in order to make it sound larger than life. Yeah, and in a summarized way, I would say that's how I view my job I'm as a sound engineer. I'm just trying to take all these elements and make things sound good and make things sound larger than life. Oh. Yeah. yeah. It's the first time I hear someone defining it that way. Hey, that's wonderful, man. Yeah, we, I mean, we need to write this down <laughs> and attribute this quote to you. <laughs> Can you share with us the various industries that you have worked in mm-hmm. and perhaps even the industries that the role of a sound engineer is desired, mm-hmm. required, slash needed? Yep. So, <clears throat> um, when I was, uh, what I spoke about just now, when I was uh, still lost and I didn't know like what I wanted to do, in NS, uh, I actually thought that like um, doing music is really just oh, be a musician, be a producer, be an engineer, be an assistant, you know, just very like vague idea of what kind of jobs there are uh, in the audio industry mm-hmm. or in the music industry, right? Um, but as the years went on and as I got exposed to more of the industry, I realized that um, the industry is not as small as people think. So Singaporeans think, a lot of Singaporeans think that the industry is very small and that they think that there's very limited opportunities for jobs. But it's not true. Um, <clears throat> if I'm talking about being a sound engineer, you can do engineering for film, you can do engineering for broadcasts, you can do engineering for TV, you can do engineering for radio, you can do engineering for live sound, concerts, conferences, commercials. Yeah, so all these different sectors all require a sound engineer. Um, If you work, if there's a large MNC, a large corporation, they will have a media team. The media team will require a sound engineer. Um, The game industry, the game industry requires a lot of sound engineers. Mm. Yeah. Um, the biggest game company in Singapore right now that has a HQ in Singapore is Ubisoft. Yeah. And I have friends in Ubisoft that were, I mean, they themselves probably never knew that these jobs existed until they found the jobs. Right. Um, Especially game music and game sound design. It's actually a very, very big sector that um, I think for a lot of uh, people who are interested in production and audio engineering in Singapore, they don't explore enough. Yeah, I personally um, am not very interested in game music and game sound design, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that that it has never been on my mind to explore the industry. But uh, I will say that for a lot of people, you should check it out, and it is an industry that has so much potential. So the jobs are there; it's just whether you can find like whether you make the effort to find it. It may not be in Singapore, it may be Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, UK, US, Australia, but um, the jobs are there and they are well-paying jobs. Um, so that is talking about 
what are the various sectors that you can actually enter, right? Um, <clears throat> then being a sound engineer itself, uh, purely as a sound engineer, if I want to split into different roles as a sound engineer, I can do that too. I can be a monitor sound engineer. Mm. I can be a FOH sound engineer, front of house sound engineer. I can be a broadcast mixing engineer, yeah, which is really specifically mixing audio to broadcast, right? And I can also be a system engineer, which is the guy who is supposed to be very technically sound and he's in charge of designing like a whole audio system for a particular event or a particular show. Yeah, so... Progressness intense. Yeah. It's uh, there's a lot of all these subgenres within the role itself mm. that uh, people don't realize, and of course you don't expect the layman to realize all of these uh, with every segment, um, whether you're in finance, banking, whatever, right? Every career, there's a lot of subgenres that you won't know until you're actually in it. Mm. Yeah, so I'll I'll, I'll just say that like um, for people who are interested in a job in this industry. And in audio engineering, uh, just keep your mind open. Yeah, um, be open to exploring different facets of a career. Yeah, there's no such thing as um, I just want to. I can only be a sound engineer that does concerts, mm -hmm. right? Specifically for sound engineering, um, you may find a path down that road that splits and you are actually better at something else and if that opportunity comes up you may want to take it yeah so because specifically for me I I sort of just wanted to do music right mm -hmm. and but over the years eventually I realized that um, there's so many aspects of like audio and music especially as a sound engineer that um, I can actually delve into that I like yeah, so I never used to be interested in designing sound systems and like uh, what I mean by designing sound systems like um, you know like if you have a bar and the bar needs a sound system right so I talked about a system engineer mm. yeah so someone like now I would come in and do the audio consultancy I'll be an audio consultant and then I'll help them design the system and you know get all the specs of all the different gear and equipment that we would need to get this place built. Uh -huh. Right? So stuff like that. Like I realized that I'm interested in this too. Right? Um, and it sort of helps me because over the years, like being varied in the knowledge and the skill set that I have with regards to audio engineering has helped me to have a more diversified income. Yeah, I'm not so... I'm not so like just stuck in case something happens in one sector of in the, mm. in the industry, right? I'm, I'm still able to survive. Yeah. Now your open-mindedness is, is really something yep. to admire. And this is kind of the purpose of this podcast. Mm. I was about to say show. Yeah. <laughs> is to like, perhaps someone listening in yep. who has no awareness of anything beyond being a concert sound engineer yep. or like a mixing engineer in a studio. Yep. I think this would be, it's lovely for them to hear this from you. Because yeah. can you imagine if you were 16 and hearing this? Yeah. You'll be like, oh. Okay, it, it, it's always good to know that there are a lot of options yeah. in a career. Yeah. Um, as a layman, you will never think that. It's just like somebody entering finance will just think that, am I going to work in a big MNC like yeah. for the rest of my life? Yeah. Just like helping people count stuff as an accountant. Uh, maybe, you know, I'm just helping people to <laughs> do bookkeeping for the rest of my life. But um, when you enter the industry already and you start your career, you realize, oh, there are so many other things actually mm. I can do in this industry. Yeah. Uh, we had a question from a viewer since you're yep. talking about designing systems and stuff like that. <laughs> yep. Do you actually need to do math to be a sound engineer? Do math and be good at math? Um, <clears throat> I would say that <laughs> at the basic level, yes, you need to do math. You need to be able to do math. <laughs> um, for most applications, uh, you, you will not really be doing math in the way that you think it is. Um, so I would say that no, you don't really need your algebra and your uh, simultaneous equations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to do um, sound engineering. Uh, but at 
a higher level when you are going to design sound systems for bigger scale events, when you are going to be planning equipment and specking equipment for bigger scale stuff. Uh, yes, some mats and some acoustical science does come into play. And, but it's less math because everything can be calculated for you on the computer. Uh, yeah, so you don't actually have to do math, but it's more knowledge. You have to know acoustical science. You have to know acoustic mats. Um, you have to know the physics behind it. Um, so I'll say specifically, it's not math, but uh, it's more physics. Yeah, it's uh, you 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 probably can't escape having knowledge of physics, especially acoustical physics at some point in the career. I see. I see. Yeah, because you have to calculate dimensions. You have to be able to know how waves, how sound waves, how electromagnetical waves work in the real world, right? And how they are applied in the real world. And that's what I mean by that knowledge uh, will be needed. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to worry about it because uh, I would say that a lot of these knowledge, uh, whether you go to college or university to study acoustical science, a lot of these knowledge, the, the real application of it is experiential learning. Mm. Yeah, you, you, you do learn a lot of it on the job, I would say like 80%. I see. I yeah. see. Um, and if you find people who are really good at it while you're on the job, then learn from them. Yeah, like ask them about it, they will teach you. Uh, and a lot of it is software based, so you need to learn how to use softwares. I see. Yeah, I so see. Uh, yeah, not really math, say more physics. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it's such a comprehensive answer. Yeah. A question I have for you is like, how have you been dealing with these COVID times? Mm. Where perhaps then initially there was a zero, there was zero gigs. Yeah. And then slowly now we have live streaming shows and things like that. Yep. How has it been for you from both a financial perspective and also your art, which is sound engineering? Yep. What have you been pivoting or doing in this time period? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I think COVID sure yeah, I mean, hit everyone in the events industry, music industry, hard. Uh, I think I would be lying if I say that like, you know, like uh, my income didn't take a huge hit. Mm. I mean, it did. Um, but it goes back to the point that like, um, I, I tried to diversify my streams of income from the start. Yeah, I mean, once my, in my career stabilized, uh, after the first three to four years, I really made an effort to diversify my streams of income. Wow. Right. So, <clears throat> I mean, I will firstly talk about my personal finance, right? So, um, I would just say that like, once you start work, <laughs> everybody should look into their personal finance and I'm not talking about like uh, investing your money in stocks and options or whatever, but at least you need to know what options are available to you to save money, to invest money. Uh, what can you do with your money that can help your own personal finance grow? Uh, I think that's very important. That's honestly the very first step. Yeah, Once you have a stable job or you have stable income, that's the very first thing that you have to do. Um, nothing in this world will, will, will change the fact that having a robust uh, personal finance plan. Mm. Uh, that that is the most important to me, la. I'm yeah. taking that advice personally, <laughs> now. It's a so, good advice, man. So okay, so more specifically to COVID. Mm. Uh, so I think that was uh quite important for me mm. to into my personal finance planning and everything to help me tide over this period. Uh. I think more specifically when it comes to pivoting and like uh diversified streams of income, it's um. I lost, like, so I was on tours, right? Um, so, yep, we couldn't tour anymore. Uh, all local shows stopped. But maybe for the first month, it was totally quiet. Mm. First month or two, it was totally quiet. And maybe I was just doing a lot more production. Like, so I still had studio work. still had production work, right? Which is why, like, you see, that's the first thing already. I already had another stream of income, which is I lost all my live shows. That's 50% of my income gone. But okay, I still have the other 50%, which is production side, mm. right? Um, <clears throat> so I had my production work to tide me over. Um, 
I started to look at like gear that I can sell. <laughs> wow. oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but didn't work out because eventually I just ended up buying more gear. Uh, yeah, because I had a lot of free time now, right? So I was at home and then I was like looking at websites. I was like, wow, I'll buy this gear. So <clears throat> I, it's a bit of a sidetrack, but um, I will say that like I actually used that first one to two months of COVID to actually do maintenance uh, so like uh, it's my own business right like mm. so it's my own business so I, I have to maintain my business I maintain my gear I looked at investing the money into more gear so that like when things pick up again mm. you know I'm ready to catch on to those opportunities right um, so that may not seem like a pivot because I am actually spending more money instead of earning more money of, instead of earning money uh, but uh to me, that's part of my plan to make sure that I stay relevant because uh, things will bounce back. Yeah, it may be two months, it may be six months, but uh, it will bounce back. So I'm preparing myself for that time. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's very important. You need to plan for the future. Yeah. Uh, and then in the meantime, I still have my production work mm. to keep me surviving. So that was my main source of income. I see. Right? During the first two months. And then after that, I started, uh, after the first one to two months, then I started getting more streaming, star streaming events, uh, events that are going just online, pre-recorded stuff that people are going to do shows online. Mm -hmm. And so all these online shows came in. Um, then a very huge part of my income was returned after that uh, one to two months of like nothing. Mm -hmm. um, then beyond that, uh, because of this whole streaming thing becoming the only way that people can get entertainment now or some sort of live entertainment um, you a lot of artists and a lot of musicians and a lot of uh, companies and organizations start to have issues and technical questions mm -hmm. about audio right and how do we do this streaming thing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how do we do it well and that's where my audio consultancy side of the business kicks in and it's another stream of income because I start to speak to these people. They require my services. You know, I, I teach them. I help them design a way to do their streaming or, you know, just basically whatever that helps them get their media onto the platform that they want to, mm -hmm. right? So the audio consultancy comes in. That's another stream of income. Um, yeah, so from then on and then in the last two to three months, it's more or less been like that. The streaming has been picking up more and more. Everybody is going to streaming now. Um, you Production is like picking back up. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, I would say that like... Um, I had a... One to two month gap where... It was really scary. Mm. But I had enough income to survive that I'm not worried. Basically because I already had a different stream of income and then once things started picking back up my third stream of income came back in yeah, yeah, yeah. so it, it it was very helpful to have this uh, three major streams of income while this whole thing has been happening this year and yeah, that's yeah. wonderful man a three-pronged approach almost yeah. to this dealing with this time yeah. period you know? on that note right, we have musical guests per episode Yep. so we're about to play a video from our featured musical guests for this episode his name is Snail God. He's a rap artist and he's about to perform his single entitled Never Do It Like This. So I hope you enjoy. Take it away, Ryan. Enjoy, guys. What's up, world? I'm known as Snail God and this is Never Do It Like This. Got my Adidas pants just for this event. <laughs> yeah. Snail God. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah Yeah Uh, uh, yeah mm. Never an outcast, but an outcast inside Taking the wrong type of sides Faking it all now, we tight fight The opposition, no mission, wrong intuition Just thoughts and continuation Just bad with me and constant 
faded, faded and shaded. My words get through the rectum. All these fake rappers talking their shit, yeah, I just wrecked them. Crown of a hot packet of red hot Cheetos. Real hoes of bits and crumbs, so we're using some cheat codes. Judge left and right, how unnecessary. Discuss from the mind, don't have any dairy. Hold up, rewind, cause the game right there beside me. So you zipped out all your words in the bag and started shaking just like jelly. Let me say something I don't quite understand. Why do people speak and act like life is planned? We on a quest for the tribe and this best thing one of a kind So think her and truly you're fine I'm good, yeah? I can't see why These things we try to settle their minds Cause I can't see what's right no more I can't see why These things we try to settle their minds Cause I can't see what's right no more Namaste to you all Stay healthy and stay blessed. And shout out to Insync SG. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that performance by Snail God. If you do, follow him on all his social media platforms. Back yeah. to Robin. I have a question for you. And this kind of relates to one of the artists that you work with. Specifically, Joanna Dong. Ah, yeah. May, may I know a little bit about your experience working with her mm -hmm. up to this point? Yeah, yeah so, I mean, I've been working with Joanna for a number of years. Uh starting from back before she went on Sing China. Um, it's been, to say the least, a, a very interesting journey with her. Um, I, I have a lot of fun. Like, um, so I, I've, I've been involved in her albums. And I mean, I'm, I'm usually her engineer for her live shows. Yeah, so, <clears throat> and whatever events that she goes to, I'm usually there. Um, it's been a very interesting journey with her because, um, you you see the difference that uh, how one event in an artist's career can trigger such a big change in the audience and the kind of people that will be attracted to your music. Mm. Yeah, I mean, for people who don't uh really know Joanna Dong, you usually does like a uh, pop jazz stuff jazz pop uh, more modern jazz pop kind of music right um she would never ever admit that like she's she does jazz but <laughs> um <laughs> but uh yes a very large part of her genre is uh jazz mm. and and i use the term jazz, jazz pop because uh, her music often infuses a lot of modern pop elements into mm, it. Kind of so it's, over. Yep. Right. So I won't say it's fusion because jazz <laughs> pop is is a genre in itself. Mm. Uh, yeah, and to me, uh, I when I started working with Joanna, uh, it was really, really the very first time that I got into very serious uh, contact with like production for jazz. Mm -hmm. And... Um, how music for jazz is produced and written and arranged. So I learned a lot about the jazz industry just off like jazz and jazz music just through working on stuff that uh is involved with Joanna. Yeah. Um how the engineering and the production is totally different. Um techniques used and the technical aspects of the job are uh, so very different from what I would use if I was recording a band in a pop genre, you know, just a purely modern pop genre, right? Um, more than that, I think my journey with Joanna has been a very heartwarming experience because I, I, I truly think that like, Joanna deserves all the the recognition that she's been getting the last few years after Sing China because she has a wonderful voice, uh, she's a wonderful person and 
I always have fun doing sound for her and being her engineer. And I think whether we are in the studio recording, whether we are doing a concert, um, I had a lot of fun during her concert. Um, and or whether we are doing a corporate show, mm. yeah, for some event, uh, we always have fun. And I think that is the most important when it comes to a relationship with an artist or anyone that you're working with. Uh, if there's a lot of element of enjoyment and fun in it, uh, the work becomes a lot easier. Mm. And I think we make beautiful, more beautiful music simply because we, we are joyful when we are working together. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of other elements and a lot of other personnel that's involved in uh, making all the music come alive for Joanna but uh, I think all of us have a lot of fun and enjoyment when we are doing stuff with Joanna and I think that's really the essence of my journey with her yeah. and it translates you know yeah. joy through sound it definitely translates yeah. one last question I have for you yeah. is what advice would you give to a 16 year old you've kind of been giving advice throughout this whole thing but now let's specifically think about someone graduating this year. Mm -hmm. Maybe just finish O levels, thinking about pursuing a path in sound engineering, because yep. they simply love music, as you did, yep. as we all do. You know. Yeah. What advice would you give to this particular person? It's always <laughs> a tough one, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I used to lecture, so in uh, audio engineering, so. Uh, this question has come to my attention many times. <laughs> uh, I'll always say that it is, it's, it's very tough um, to tell someone about the music and audio industry and what you should do beyond, right? What beyond? Yeah, it's really what you should do beyond. Um, I'll say that if you're 16 and you're wondering what you should do now, uh, yeah, you really love music, um, but you have no idea whether you want to enter this industry. Um, and I will really caveat that word. You have no idea whether you want to enter this industry. Uh, you have no idea whether you want to be a musician, uh, whether you want to be a producer, whether you want to be a singer. No, just no idea. Then I will say, um, just continue doing it as a hobby first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're 16. Um, don't, don't focus too much on like uh, trying to dive into anything. Uh, just be a teenager. Um, explore your hobbies. Uh, do well in your studies so that you have the options to do whatever you want. Um, doesn't matter whether it's music, uh, whether it's production, whether it's uh, banking, whether it's being a doctor. But um, I, w I would say the caveat is always in Singapore at least like if you do well in your studies, you, you have options. Yeah. Um, and then in the meantime, like make sure that your hobby in music is nurtured. Like make it a point to make sure you do your craft well, uh, practice your craft, whatever it is, whether it's playing the guitar, the bass, the piano, uh, whether it's being a mixing engineer, whether it's recording, continue pursuing that um, as a hobby. And, Maybe at one point in time, while, because you're still 16, you'll probably be studying after this. From 16 to 20, you'll probably still be studying. In that four years, you, your hobby may start to generate income. Like naturally, because if you practice your craft, you go on gigs, you do shows, <clears throat> you do events, you know, like sometimes people just hear, hey, you can sing really well. Hey, can you do this show with me? Or whatever you know naturally you'll get jobs you'll get gigs um and when you reach a point whereby you realize my hobby can be a job mm. because i'm actually earning a, a income that i feel is sufficient for me to now say that i can do this as a job and i would say that's actually the best progression yeah that's actually the best way that i can tell you to uh, look to this industry uh, especially if you're a musician I'm being realistic, right? I'm being realistic. Um, of course, some people at 16 years old, 
if you're Justin Bieber, you're already a millionaire. It's a different story, right? But I'm being realistic about the gigging musician in Singapore, the gigging uh, sound engineer in Singapore. It's uh, you, 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 you can't dump all your eggs into one basket, especially when you're still a student. You still have your studies and academics ahead of you. Uh, leave your options open. Make sure you do well in your studies. Um, and nurture your hobby. Make sure that you are meeting people, network, uh, make friends in the industry. Uh, eventually, you will know the point when you have enough income to say that or even tell your parents, mm-hmm. hey man, I don't think I need to study anymore because <laughs> I'm earning enough money. <laughs> yeah, right? And that will be the best way to get your start in the industry. Yeah, it's to treat it as a hobby and allow the hobby to naturally earn you money as you become an adult. Yeah. All right, that's that's lovely advice. Slightly different than some of the previous guests we've had, but I think it's so pertinent actually. Loving the thing first as a hobby. Yep. Wow. And on that note, I think we are at the end of this episode. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation I've been having with Robin. Thank you yeah. for doing this. It's my pleasure being uh, here. My name is Ridwan and I'm from Insing SG. What this is, is a monthly, I keep saying weekly, monthly podcast where we feature practitioners from various industries. Today it was sound engineering, last week, last month, it was arts management. And we're going to feature people from education, from event companies, so on and so forth. Maybe even from dance one day. Follow us on our social media platforms, from Facebook to LinkedIn to Instagram on Insing SG. And one thing that I just want to plug a little bit is that we have an event coming up in the first week of October called InSync Gives Back. It's an event where we run one of our programs for free. Hmm. So for more details, you can find out in the link that we will put in the description. It's going to be a PTIX link to find out more information about this particular free program. Okay, guys. On that note, thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye. See you guys.